Amen. Hey, when you think of military, you think of Chris Hunt, don't you? You want that guy standing at the gates. When he said give, I started to empty my pockets. Okay, Razorback fans, all together. Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> Welcome back to our study of the Gospel of John. Um, last week, Jim said this, for every follower of Jesus, we have a purpose statement. And it was lived out perfectly through Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And his purpose statement was this, Jesus, I must decrease, you must what? increase. Simply put, man, you are number one, and I'm a distant, distant second. Prized, cherished, beloved, but a distant second. If you do not have a chance to um, watch or, or listen to Jim's talk, I highly recommend that you download it, you take a look at it. Okay, um, before we look at our text this morning, let me share a true story with you. In the summer of 2007, uh, a father and son were um, out for a walk. It was their tradition in a farmer's field in northern England. It was a father and his older son, um, grown son, and they used to like to do metal detecting together. And they would go to this field all the time, and throughout the years, they would get baubles and trinkets and buttons and basically nothing. It was just father-son time. So um, this one time they go, summer, July of 2007, and the sun's metal detector begins to buzz like crazy. So they decide to dig up whatever was buried. And what they brought out of the ground was a metal bowl that turned out to be over a thousand years old, buried by, by Vikings, and it was filled with this. Over 600 gold and silver coins that 16 years ago was valued at over a, a million dollars US. They thought they're just going out for a normal walk on a July afternoon in England. But, but they ended up finding a treasure that would change their entire lives. Our story for today is, is very similar. It's the tale of a woman who went out on a normal day's activity to get some water from a well, and yet she found more than she expected, more than just some silver and gold coins, this woman found eternal life. In the same way, maybe some of you this morning, some of you watching online, you're, you're like, you know, I'm doing my duty. I appreciate that, by the way. I'm going to church, just, it's another Sunday. It's another normal church day. But maybe God has something more in mind for you. Maybe this is the day that you, like the woman in the story, this is the day you find eternal life. Maybe this is the day, follower of Jesus, where you, you go, oh my word, <laughs> I'm filled with living water. I need to rethink some of the things that I'm doing. Okay, um, let's look together at this other true story. Do me a favor, if you haven't already, open your Bibles and Bible devices to John, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And before we, before we dive in, I want to give us a little bit of an overview of this amazing conversation. And I want us to see, in a culture that did not value women, I mean, did not value women, I want you to see how much God values women. So, some fun facts. Jesus' dialogue with the woman at the well is the longest recorded conversation in the New Testament. Get this. He talks to the Samaritan woman longer than he talks at any one point to his 12 disciples, his accusers, Pontius Pilate, or even his own family members. Moreover, she is the first person and the first ethnic religious outsider to whom Jesus reveals his identity to. And this might be the most compelling fact of all, she is the first believer in any of the Gospels to straight away become an evangelist. She goes back to her village, goes back to her city, and basically leads almost the entire village to Christ. John chapter 4 and verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. Verse 3. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Verse 4, underline this, think about it. We'll come back to it from time to time. Now, he had to go through Samaria. Last week, we learned Jesus was working his way north. He had left Jerusalem, 
from the Passover. You remember Kevin's talk when he was in the temple and he was turning over tables and it was amazing. Listen to that one as well. So he left Jerusalem after the Passover. He was on his way home to Galilee, but he needed to pass through Samaria. One little problem, Jesus was Jewish. And, and the Jews and Samaritans did not play well together. Samaritans were people with some Jewish background who had intermarried with other nations to become a mixed race. They had their own version of the Jewish Bible. They had their own temple. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. The Orthodox, Orthodox Jews of that time hated Samaritans so intensely that often, not always, they, they would travel miles out of their way just to avoid Samaritan territory. As you, if you look at that map to the right, Sychar, Jacob's well, that would be even part of the well there is what we call the West Bank today. The West Bank. The animosity between the Jews and Samaritans was so intense that if you were a Jewish family and someone in your family, man or woman, married a Samaritan, you would hold a funeral and consider them dead. You would see them in town and go, I don't even know who you are. I don't even know who you are. So verse five, he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired as he was from the journey. Just remember this, another message for another time. Jesus was 100% God, he was 100% what? Man. He got tired, he got hungry, he got thirsty. He was tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, "Who will you give me a, a drink? Now in any culture, water is really important, especially in arid, hot culture. So um, you lived near wherever you could get water. This was a well that dated all the way back to Genesis in the Old Testament. You may recall we went through the life of Joseph this summer and we literally talked about Jacob's well and how Jacob passed that well on to his son, Joseph. So there's this well, and it was customary for the, the, the women and the children to go get, go get water. And so a, a woman from Samaria comes to draw water. At what time? You can shout it out. Noon. Noon. The, the heat of the day. Plus, it was noon, right? When, when you wake up in the morning, wouldn't you like some water? <laughs> Like, just to get on with your day? But it was noon. Women and children didn't get water in the heat of the day. It was too hot. So why is she coming at noon? We're going to learn as we go. But um, she is a, a woman who is rejected. Rejected people got water, and she was a rejected person. She didn't want to be seen by people, and people didn't want to see her. Morning well time was a time for visiting a little morning gossip for catching up, fellowship, so to speak, and they wanted nothing to do with her, so she had to come in the heat of the day um, all by herself because she wasn't welcome. She was dejected and rejected. Verse 7, again, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman, we don't, we don't know her name, one day we will, said to him, <laughs> Let me, let me interpret the Greek here. You talking to me? You, you talking to me? You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How could you ask me for a, a drink? Jews don't associate with us, especially with me. There are a lot of cultural barriers that Jesus is hurtling right now. Uh, three that come, come to mind. The first barrier, and we just talked about, Jews and Samaritans. Second barrier, righteous versus unrighteous. Third barrier is this one. Men didn't talk to women, especially rabbis. They didn't talk to women. This is really cool, funny, weird. But as I, I Googled Pharisees, um, what I came up with is in the Talmud, there were seven types of Pharisees. And one of the most righteous types of Pharisee was the bruised Pharisee. You're like, bruised Pharisee? Why? Because the bruised Pharisee was so um, fastidious at never looking at a woman, he would what? Bonk, bonk. And so he, he'd like shine her on his forehead, his arm, his nose. And people were like, oh, there's a bruised Pharisee. That's a godly man. I wish I had bruises like that.
So she's rather startled and stunned because here's a man who is a Jewish rabbi in Samaria wanting to have a conversation with, with me, a rejected woman. Not only that, but just practically, Jesus is thirsty. He doesn't have anything to draw water with. That well's about 75 feet deep. He can't get a drink. You say, well, Lee, what's, what's the point? Well, there was a custom in that culture that said if a Jewish person drank from the vessel of a Samaritan person, they would be considered ritually unclean. This would be the equivalent of Jim Crow laws in, in the tragic history of our nation. It's hard to believe now, right? There are some here who still remember we don't drink from that fountain because they do. We don't eat there because they, they do. They're unclean and we're clean. Let me just state an obvious, but it needs to be said. You'll see it behind me. We are all unclean and Jesus comes to make us clean. Religious people are all worried about being defiled. Don't taste, don't touch, don't do, don't hang out with. Not understanding that they were born defiled and they need to be made clean too. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Conversation change. She's kind of trying to lead. Later on, she'll try and take it back, but Jesus is in charge. What Jesus is doing here, remember we, we spent a lot of time in John 3, that, that long conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, but not as long as this. What he's doing here is the same thing he did with Nicodemus. He was taking an earthly need and connecting it to a deeper spiritual truth. The last time this woman had had cold, clean, refreshing water was 24 hours ago. It was hot and she was thirsty and she's dreaming of this water. And Jesus says to her, you know what you're, you're really thirsty for? It's not cold water. It's living water. And I can give it to you right now if you want. Now, I think you know what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about salvation. Again, we go back to Nicodemus. Here's what you really need, Nicodemus. You need to be born from above. You need to be born again. <laughs> I am righteous and religious. Yeah, I, I know, but you need to be born again. You need a new spirit. You need Holy Spirit. He was talking about what it means to move from being uh, apart from God to being in relationship with God. Jesus was talking with her about what she's really thirsty for. In her heart, she was thirsty to connect with God, find forgiveness, and to be loved. She was totally thirsty for God, but she didn't get it. She didn't know it. She has this God-sized hole in her heart, as Augustine would say. Um, she was searching for God, but she couldn't find him. So guess what? God found her. I got to go through Samaria. Yeah, but it, those are, I have to go through Samaria. I have to. Verse 11, sir, the woman said, um, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, 75 feet. Where, where can you get this living water? Understandably, she's thinking natural um, and physical, not supernatural and spiritual. Are you greater than our father? Verse 12, Jacob, who gave us the well and drunk from it himself. She's bragging a little bit here, and as did also his sons and his, his livestock. This well has been there for over a thousand years, thousands of years. It's amazing. Why? Because where water flows, um, life flows. Where water flows, things get cooler. Dead things come to life. So it is with the soul. Even greater, from, even greater than a free-flowing well is a hot place that's, that has been there for thousands of years is the ministry of Holy Spirit to our souls. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Basically, you got to keep coming back. You can't take it with you. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. 
Jesus is saying that there is a deep, profound satisfaction at the soul level that is only possible through the ministry of Holy Spirit. Nothing else can satisfy like him. Indeed, the water I, I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman, the woman said to him, verse 15, sir, give me this water so that I, I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. This woman is lonely. She's an outcast. She's shame-filled. She's rejected. No one has ever poured love into this woman. It appears that all men have ever done is taken life from this woman. Please hear this. What she's looking for at the soul level cannot be met by any human being. Now, I want to say something that might be hard for some to hear, so please know my heart. My heart behind this is only for your good. But, but the reason some of you keep having broken, painful relationships is because you're trying to fill a need that can only be filled by Jesus. This is, this is what she's doing. Basically, she's saying this. I, I need a man who will never leave me, never abandon me, never forsake me, never betray me, never fail me. That's a resume that only Jesus has. If Ruth, my wife, were to hand uh, me Jesus' res resume the day we were married, and she said, Lee, you have to live out Jesus' resume in our marriage for it to be successful, it would have destroyed our marriage. There's no way that I could fulfill Jesus' resume in her life, nor could she fulfill it in my life. I cannot ultimately bring Ruth joy, meaning, and purpose. Nobody but Jesus can do that. Now, it doesn't mean that Ruth uh, and I aren't trying to grow every day. We call this sanctification. By God's grace to be more like Jesus, we're, tr we're trying to do that. But we're still not Jesus or Holy Spirit, and we cannot be living water for one another. This is the woman's problem. This is her pain. And Jesus says, you, you keep coming to the well for your physical body, um, but you need to take the well with you for your soul. Verse 16, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, um, you have had five husbands. 2,000 years ago, this was definitely culturally unacceptable. Some of you are here, and you're divorced, and you wonder, is there forgiveness or, or love for me? Uh, I've been in pastoral ministry for over 30 years, and you would not believe how many times people have said to me, um, I've been divorced. Can I still come to your church? And I always say, well, of course, that's why we're here. My, my dad um, was married four times, uh, we think, allegedly, probably more. <laughs> 23 and me will mess with you. And uh, my mom has been married three times. 41 years ago, I had become a follower of Jesus at 17, and I invited my mom to church. And she said, uh, Lee Jr., um, I'm an alcoholic. And I'm a hypocrite, and I've been married three times. And Holy Spirit must have done that because I was only 17. I didn't know any better. And I just said, Mom, that's what church is for. It's for broken people and alcoholics and hypocrites. I said, Mom, that's me. I'm, I'm broken, and I'm a hypocrite. And 41 years later, I'm still broken, and at times I'm still a hypocrite. Ruth and I were sharing the gospel with someone over the phone, a family member the other day, and we, I mean, it's, it's go time. There's a good chance he's gonna die in the next few months. He said, do you know Jesus? He said, I, th I think I do, but I'm a hypocrite. And I said, I, I'm a hypocrite. That was Tuesday for me. Verse 18, let's go back to it. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have 
is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I love this. I can see you're a prophet. Like, what? The, what are you, some kind of mentalist? What, what just happened? Right now, the conversation is, is going to make an interesting pivot. Some people say she's trying to change the subject. Others say she's staying right on track. Either way, Jesus is in charge. Verse 20, she says, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. But, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Uh, we need to point out that Samaritan worship on Mount Gerizim, that's the mountain that she's referring to, was a corrupted form of, of Judaism. It had been established by an, an apostate Jewish priest who married the daughter of Sanballat, who was the enemy of Nehemiah um, in the rebuilding of Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. You say, well, what's, do me a favor. Go back to the Old Testament. If you're looking at your Bible to your left, find the, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and read them. <clears throat> It'll give you some more background. Um, it was a false religion. It was a sexual religion, not for the right reasons. It was a religion that sacrificed children. Uh, it had Jewish elements in it, it, including the Pentateuch. And then it was all mixed up with pagans who came in after the Assyrian captivity in 722 BC who had intermarried with the remaining Jews in, in the northern kingdom. It was just a mess. So she meets Jesus, a Jew, and she being a Samaritan who worships in Samaria, in Samaria she says, well, where's the right place to worship? Like, where do I go to church? How do I meet with God? And then Jesus responds, John chapter four and verse 21. He says, woman, now we have to stop here. Um, I know this is hard for us to understand this because if I said woman to my wife, you'd be attending my memorial the next day. <laughs> he was a good man. He shouldn't have called Ruth woman, right? It's a term of endearment. I know. It's a cultural thing. We don't get it. Um, how many of you know the word um, gordo in Spanish? You know what it means? Fatty. It's a term of endearment. I know. I know. It's like, hey, fatty, but I love you. Okay, I, whatever. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Uh, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews, yet a time is coming, verse 23, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Verse 24, God is spirit and his, his worship, and, he's, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Jesus says um, the Father is seeking worshipers. <clears throat> But does he say that the Father is seeking worship? This is really important. Worshippers worship. No, he's not seeking a certain kind of worship. He's not seeking a certain kind of music, a certain kind of style. He's seeking worshipers. He's seeking people. Worship is, this is the danger, right? This is the danger of making a church building the only place I can go to worship, or a style, the only place I can go to worship. This is the danger. Worship is not something we do on Sunday mornings and then, well, I get on with my life. Worship isn't something that starts and stops, but it's a lifestyle. It says in verse 24 that the Father is seeking it worshipers that will worship him in spirit and truth. Spirit meaning that God is spirit and we have Holy Spirit and we connect with God at the spirit or the soul level. Truth means that we worship the right God the right way because the right God gets to decide how he wants to be worshiped. Sometimes people will come to church and they'll say to me after the service or maybe sometime later, I'll say, I hadn't, I hadn't seen you around. Well, you know, um, your worship doesn't work for me. That's the wrong question to ask. The question we need to ask, does it work for God? because we're not worshiping us. We're not worshiping a style. We're the band or the choir or whatever, and he's the audience. Please write this down, it's, it's really easy. We don't worship because God needs it, but we worship because we need it. In, in the summer of 88, the summer of love for Lee and Ruth, we were dating and then engaged. I went to her 
PCA Church. It was brand new to me. Presbyterian Church of America. Do you know that? And not all are this way, especially now, but back in 88, her church um, pews, really hardwood pews, beautiful stained glass. Um, it was liturgical. We recited all sorts of things. We said the Lord Prayer every time. We sang a bunch of hymns. There was an organ. You know what? I could worship. I could worship. I was in Bahamas 20 years ago with a group of students in a Pentecostal holiness church. We did the rumba around the service for 20 minutes. Holy <sighs> vey. Holy vey. Oh, can a brother get some water? I needed a woman at the well to draw water for me. It's a thousand degrees. I worshiped. Hymns, contemporary, mixed, only contemporary, only. We can worship. The devil wants to make worship about you. Well, it's about me. No, no, it's never about you. It's not about me. It's about God. Just like our bodies need exercise, our souls need to worship. We worship in spirit and in truth. Thus, the word of God has to be opened. Why? That's how we know what truth is. If you go to a church where the word of God is not open and it's filled with metaphors and stories and pithy statements and in a couple scriptures kind of sort of taken out of context, leave that church. Leave it quickly. So she's asking, where are we to go to worship this God? Is it Jerusalem? Is it Samaria? And Jesus, Jesus basically says this, sister, woman, it's a new day. It's a new day. You don't come to God. God comes to you. You don't go to the temple. You become a temple. I, I would encourage you to read the book of Ephesians, and they'll flesh that out even more. First Peter, he'll flesh that. The writers will flesh that out even more, what it means to be a living temple. Let me encourage all of us who follow Jesus. If you are a child of God, you are a temple of God. The same Holy Spirit that indwelt the Holy of Holies and empowered Jesus lives in you and me. Can I get an amen to that? So now God's presence goes with us. The streams of living water go with us no matter where we go. Work, play, vacation, family, reunions, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. I can't wait for him to come. Then Jesus declared, ta-da. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just so cool. You're looking at him. He rarely did this. I, the one speaking to you, I am. He rarely did this. Jesus doesn't often clearly reveal himself, but he does to this woman. Why? This is really deep. You ready? This is in the Greek. Because he loves her. I must go through Samaria. I must. This is a divine appointment scheduled by Jesus that she was unaware of. She was just doing her thing, and Jesus met her. How many of you experienced Jesus in the same way? You were just doing your thing, and Jesus showed up and changed everything. You're like, yeah, I, I got invited to go to this thing called Crew. It was an event. Next thing you know, I love Jesus. <laughs> I was at work, and this, we hired this new guy. He always had a smile on his face, prayed before he ate, got into some conversations. The next thing you know, I'm confessing sin, and I know Jesus. Maybe for, for some of you, this is your day, a day where, where Jesus scheduled an appointment with you to change your life, and you never saw it coming. Verse 27, it gets good and funny. I just love this. These are things I wouldn't put in the Bible if I were writing it, but God does. Just then his disciples returned. They missed the whole thing! And we're surprised to find him talking to um, a woman. They were saying to each other, basically, does Jesus know the rules? He didn't know the rules. How does he not know the rules? But no one asked, um, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? 
Verse 28, then, then leaving her water jar. Let's stop there for a second because I, I don't want us to miss that. Did, did you catch it? The one thing she needed the most is no longer the most important thing. It's amazing that after we meet Jesus, the stuff we cared um, about is no longer all that important. There are things that before you knew Jesus, you worked your whole life for. You dreamed, you schemed, you lied. You became a workaholic. There are things that before you knew Jesus, you worked your whole life for. And now that you know Jesus, you're like, I don't need that anymore. I'm not running after that anymore. I'm not worshiping that anymore. It's all good. I met Jesus. I met Jesus. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, this is too good to pass up. The town won't talk to her. She won't talk to the town. Now she can't keep her mouth quiet. She's a missionary. By the way, um, we don't need to be a Bible scholar to tell people about Jesus. We just need to know Jesus. She knows him. She's got to tell somebody. Verse 29, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? This woman was running from from people. Now she's running to people. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, the disciples, I love this, urged him. Rabbi, you must eat. <clears throat> I hate to pick on the disciples, but um, there definitely seems to be a clueless quality about them. It's obvious that Jesus didn't um, pick these guys because they had it all together. Amen. Um, revival is about to break out. Now get this, she's running into town, she's telling people about Jesus, some are accepting, some are coming back out. I mean, revival is going on. Woo! And they're like, uh, did you want the waffle fries, Jesus, with your chicken sandwich? <laughs> but he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples, it gets better, said to each other, could someone have brought him food? The disciples are like, Wait a second, did someone make a Chick-fil-A run ahead of us? Man, that's our job. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What Jesus is saying is this, and I don't want us to miss this. My body needs food, but more importantly, my soul needs a purpose. Let me pick on believers now. There's some of you in here, and you're like, I know Jesus, I love Jesus, I've drank from his well. Living water flows in me, but I've gone back to that old stagnant water and I have no purpose. Could be sin, could be other idols, could be busy, you're busy, could be you're a first worlder and you're making a lot of money, you're like, God, why'd you bless me with so much money? Now I don't love you as much. Could be halftime, you're like, after 50, between 50 and 80, and you're like, I'm just tired. Let me give you two words to dispute, I'm just tired. Jim Hall. Dude's 142 years old. For most of his life, he did ministry for free. They're like, well, then he got paid. Well, then he did it and got paid. He'll retire one day, and he'll do it until he says hey to Jesus. Here's Jim's, here's Jim's motto, seriously, no regrets. No regrets. Well, you know, I'm, I'm tired. Who isn't tired? You hit 40, it's all downhill, baby. It's all downhill. You need to be stumbling and bumbling and fumbling into eternity doing King Jesus type of stuff with no regrets. My body needs food, but more importantly, our souls need purpose. I hear this all the time. I, I don't know what the will of God is. Jesus says, my body needs food, but more importantly, my soul needs a purpose, and my purpose is to do the work and the will of God, and when I do that, my soul is nourished. Verse 35. 
Jesus says, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Let me summarize what he's saying. Um, Two words, three words. People need Jesus. You're like, Lee, have you, have you looked around at the world lately? Oy vey, people need Jesus. What, okay, let's just go local, okay? Like people are shaking their fists and they're saying horrible things. Have you seen the TikTok lately, Lee? It's terrible. <clears throat> people need Jesus. My family is beyond dysfunctional. You have no idea how bad they are. Thanksgiving and Christmas is coming and I wanna go, ha, they need Jesus. They don't need you to be perfect. Do you, you think the Samaritan woman at the well was completely sanctified, right? She just got excited about Jesus because Jesus changed her life. And here's what we need to understand. We're all Samaritans. The point is we're all messed up. We're all spiritually confused. As the hymn writer says, all of us have hearts that are prone to wander away from Jesus. Also, I want us to be greatly encouraged about Jesus' approach to outreach. Notice how, how practical he is. For some people, um, for most, salvation is a process. And for others, it happens immediately. That's rare, but it does. The point is, we don't know where people are at. God does, but we don't. So our goal is to be faithful, to lovingly tell people that they need Jesus. Let me put in a shameless plug right now. I should have had it up on the screen. I don't. Um, on, on February 9th and 10th, we'll be doing another, um, another one of our salt and light classes. Um, to me, it's the best class method ever on how to share your faith. As we're walking through this story right now, that's what you'll do on a Friday night and a Saturday morning. Kevin will teach. Um, Nathan will teach. It's unbelievable. Highly recommend that you sign up for that. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans um, from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me um, everything I did. I love this. She's no longer ashamed of her story because God changed her story and now she stewards her story. Wow. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed two days. Jesus got kicked out of his hometown. The religious leaders hated him, but the Samaritans are like, you're a cool hang, dude. You're amazing. And because of his words, verse 41, many more <clears throat> became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. As, as we finish, I just want to point out three different ways that we can look at this woman. I will be brief, but three lenses, okay? The first one is this. We can look at her through the through the eyes, the lens of our current culture, like right now. Our current culture would say this, come on, Lee. She's an adult who's chosen to live with a man who's not her husband, big deal. Love is love. Whether it's that or any kind of lifestyle, love is love. They're consenting adults. Who are we to judge? Judge not, lest you be judged. That's one way. Um, Second way, we can look at her through the lens of a spirit of religion, legalism, much like they were doing in her current culture. Um, what a shameful woman. She should have a scarlet letter S for shameful. Ladies, keep your husband away, your husband's away from her. Yeah, I know, she collects water when it's hot and she's lonely, she deserves it. They'll talk about her, but won't talk to her. They're not gonna help her change, but they sure will judge her. That's another lens. <clears throat> I think you know where I'm going with this. Third lens, um, we can see her through the eyes of Jesus. Jesus saw her as valuable, 
surrounded in Trinitarian love, made in the image of God. Worthy of a spiritual conversation, the longest in the Gospels, that would lead to abundant life now, which she needed abundant life now, and eternal life. Jesus knew her shameful past and present, and he valued her. I must go through Samaria. I must. Let me uh, encourage us, before we judge somebody, anybody, um, let's ask them to tell their story. Then, then after we hear their story and we have some form of relationship with them, we can lovingly say, um, whew, that's some story. You need a reset with Jesus. Until you drink his living water, until the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you're gonna keep searching and struggling and living without hope. And maybe... <clears throat> That's some of you this morning. Maybe you're watching online and you're like, that's me. I'm living without hope. Well, in a few minutes, after we have a baptism, which I'm really excited about, there's gonna be people all around this room. They're on our prayer team. They're gonna actually start coming up now. If you're on the prayer team, start coming up now. And they would love to tell you what it means to have living water. I would love to. I'll be standing up. You don't have to go to me, but I would love to tell you. It's not a building. It's not a style of worship. It's not a political movement. It's Jesus. Jesus.